Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Good morning. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. We want you to know that we are devoted to helping you meet your spiritual needs. We want to help you know the Word of God better. We want you to be able to separate the truth from error. We feel just like the Apostle John felt when he said in 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. If you have a Bible question or want to enroll in our cost-free Bible study course by mail, please call us at 1-800-380-LTBS. That's 1-800-380-5827. Or contact us through LetTheBibleSpeak.com. Last week, we began our study of the Good Samaritan from Luke 10, 25 through 37. We want to just pick up where we left off and address one of the questions you have submitted after our message. You may view the first part of this message at LetTheBibleSpeak.com. Our focal passage reads from Luke 10, verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus to him, Go and do likewise. More on the parable of the Good Samaritan. But first, enjoy our song. I am sorry for a city on that bright eternal shore Where the saints of God shall gather and live on forevermore Tis a land of love and purity Life where my possessions lie Oh, 
The philosophy of the priest and Levite was, what's mine is mine and I'll keep it. Their time, their energy, their heart was closed to everyone and everything that did not belong to them, their family, their people. But we don't know exactly what they were thinking. No doubt the priest and Levite justified themselves. They may have thought that the injured man was already dead and that they need not risk becoming ceremonially defiled. Maybe they were concerned for their own safety. Maybe they were running late for a religious activity. Could they have feared being blamed for what happened by attempting to help? The approach of minding their own business is natural for man. By now, the Jewish audience was likely expecting a common Jew to come on the scene and be the hero. If they were, they were wrong. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. What? A Samaritan? Well, this can't be good news, the people thought. Will he finish him off? Before we go further, let's see if we can see why Jesus used a Samaritan. Who were these people? Who are these people? There are still over 600 Samaritans living on Mount Gerizim on the West Bank where Jesus met the woman at the well. It's fascinating that the name Samaritan is derived from the Hebrew term keepers of the law. Why? They accept only the first five books of the Old Testament and claim to be the only true worshipers of Israel. Incidentally, this is where in 330 B.C. the Samaritans built their temple while the Jews' temple was in Jerusalem. The Samaritans were particularly hated by the Jews in Jesus' day. The Samaritans lived between Galilee to the north and Judea to the south. These folks lived in the old northern kingdom of Israel. In 721 B.C., Israel was conquered by Assyria, and Sargon II carried off over 27,000 captives and resettled the area with folks from other parts of the Assyrian Empire, 2 Kings 17, 24. Their descendants, the Samaritans, were looked down on as half-breeds and heretics by the Jews. At times, relations between Jews and Samaritans had been civil, but in Jesus' day, feelings were hostile. To make matters worse, sometime around 9 AD, at midnight during a Passover, some Samaritans deliberately scattered bones in the Jerusalem temple to desecrate it. The Jews were outraged. What remained now was disdain and hatred. As John observed in John 4, 9, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. We're talking about racial and religious animosity and hatred. This prejudice led the Jews to think, if not verbalize, that all Samaritans are evil. We can only speculate, but if Jesus would have preached this parable in the north during the Civil War, wouldn't he have used a rebel instead of a Samaritan? During World War II in the United States, wouldn't Jesus have used a German or Japanese man? During the 60s, a hippie. Each of these generations, or each of these rather, generates the same emotions generated by the Samaritan. The idea is, who would fit in in the place of the Samaritan? If Jesus was preaching this parable today, what if Jesus were preaching to you? Notice this wasn't merely racial bigotry. This disdain was as much religious as it was racial. Would Jesus have used a Hindu, Muslim, or atheist? a Baptist, Catholic, or Mormon, if he was preaching this at your church today. The whole point is, the one expected to be from the lower class racially and spiritually turns out to be more dependable than the higher class of Orthodox Jewish religious officials. You know, we could even use this passage as justification for despising all lawyers. When we lived in Tennessee a few years ago, I was privileged to visit with Kenneth Starr in Murfreesboro. Starr's father, incidentally, was a Church of Christ preacher in Texas. Starr said in the speech that he gave at our children's school that 
one of the problems with telling lawyers jokes is that lawyers don't like them, but nobody else understands them. He added, you know a lawyer is an individual whose principal role is to protect his clients from others of his profession. Then he said, a lawyer is someone that can write a 10,000 word document and call it a brief. Next, he said, it doesn't matter what font he uses, it always comes out in fine print. Then he said, have you ever thought about the difference between a good lawyer and a great lawyer? A good lawyer knows the law, a great lawyer knows the judge. As dean of Pepperdine Law School, he stressed on the serious side, you know, not all lawyers are bad. He went on to point out that Paul wrote in Titus 3.13, send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. I remember my dad raking lawyers over the coals in a sermon one time, only to be told by the treasurer after services, I'm a lawyer. A preacher friend that I love and respect is making a lawyer himself. You see, prejudice comes in many forms. Jesus is warning us against it in this parable. A Samaritan village denies hospitality to Jesus and his disciples in Luke 9. In Matthew 10, verse 5, Jesus forbids his disciples to visit any Samaritan city. Why? Because he was sent to the Jews. In John 8, intended as a vicious slander, the Jews called Jesus a Samaritan and demon-possessed. Remember that although Jesus respectfully confronted the false worship of Samaria in John 4, he also showed by example that a man's worth is not based on his ethnic identity or religious heritage. Jesus reaches out to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. Then when Jesus heals the ten lepers in Luke 17, the only one who returned to praise God was a Samaritan. Incredibly, no doubt to his Jewish audience, Jesus continued in verse 33, and when he saw him, he had compassion. When the Samaritan saw the bloodied victim, he had compassion when the priest and Levite did not. The Greek word for compassion refers to the intestines. This wasn't a, a feeling in his mind on the surface, but something he felt in the deepest recesses of his heart and of his gut. When the Samaritan saw the suffering man lying half dead by the side of the road, something happened in his gut, something that made it impossible for him to walk away. Jesus is saying, if we love our neighbor and see him in need, it will strike a deep chord. Notice that this Samaritan gave of his heart, verse 34 and 35, so he went to him, gave of his time, and bandaged his wounds, gave of his energy, pouring on oil and wine, gave of his possessions. And he set him on his own animal, gave of his transportation, he'd now be on foot, brought him to an inn and took care of him, gave of his strength. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave of his money, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come, I will repay you. Gave of his visa, left a blank check. Remember, the robber's approach was, what's yours is mine, I'll take it. The approach of the priest and the Levite was, what's mine is mine, I'll keep it. The Samaritan's approach, in contrast, is, what is mine is yours you may have it. When love floods our heart, it is like oxygen filling our lungs, and a genuine need arising is like a trumpet placed on our lips. We can't help but sound off. Too many times, though, Jesus is saying, God's people walk around with only enough love to blow a kazoo. Notice the love of Jesus, that love that Jesus is speaking of, is more than a feeling. Hear God speak in James 2.16. And if one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Genuine love, like genuine faith, takes action. 
love initiates genuine love doesn't have to be poked and prodded love can't sit still when it sees genuine need look at all the action in this passage he went to him he bandaged him pouring in oil and wine set him on his own animal brought him to an inn and took care of him gave two denarii to the innkeeper six active verbs love acts Jesus uses six verbs to detail how active was this man's compassion. Love does not pass by on the other side. Love moves us toward those in need. Love isn't afraid to get his hands dirty. Love isn't afraid to work. I can't help everywhere and everyone, but I can help someone somewhere, and I should. Notice the end of a scripture where we usually focus at the beginning Ephesians 4 26 Ephesians 4 28 rather let him who stole steal no longer but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need verse 36 so which of these three Jesus asks do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves don't you know that this question hung in the air after a chorus of oohs from the audience? I imagine you could hear a pin drop. This lawyer, starved for attention, suddenly had all that he wanted and then some. His brilliant, educated mind, trained to find loopholes, could find no way out. Verse 37, and he said, He who showed mercy on him. This was Jesus' message from the start. He said in Matthew 7, 12, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Two issues tended to plague lawyers, and we're tempted to do the same. Number one, they wanted to limit who their neighbor was. We learn from this story you can't do that. Number two, they didn't practice what they preached. Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Matthew 23, verse 4. Most of the time, they got the law, and they taught the law, but they did not walk the law. They focused on theory. Jesus focused on action. That's why Jesus concluded so strongly with these words in verse 37. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. In other words, stop talking and start doing. Again, in verse 25, the lawyer asked the right question. The question we all need to ask and act upon. What did he say? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to go to heaven? Isn't it strange that most preachers are offended by this kind of question? That's right. They say, don't say do. That's a bad word. You cannot do anything to be saved. Funny how Jesus didn't respond that way, don't you think? Funny how people kept asking this question and men of God never shunned it, but went with it. That's because they understood what the Spirit taught in 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Look at the book of Acts. Paul asked Jesus on the Damascus road in Acts 9, verse 6. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Cornelius was told in Acts 10, verse 6, Peter is lodging with Simon a tanner. He will tell you what you must do. The Philippian jailer asked in Acts 16, 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? In Acts 2, verse 37 and 38, the assembled Jews pled, Men and brethren, what shall we do? None of them were shamed for asking the question, as some preachers do today. Instead, they were told what they needed to do. In each of these occasions, they were told to be baptized. In each of these cases, the urgency of baptism for the forgiveness of sins was understood. As a result, they did not delay baptism for a week or two, but were baptized immediately. 
Even when he learned the truth sometime after midnight, the Bible says the Philippian jailer was baptized the same hour of the night in which he learned that Jesus saves. Did you have that kind of urgency to be baptized when you decided to turn your life over to Jesus? If not, then you weren't baptized the Bible way. You weren't baptized to be saved, Mark 16, 16. You weren't baptized to put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. You weren't baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. You weren't baptized to wash away your sins, Acts 22, 16. You weren't baptized into Jesus Christ, Romans 6, 3. You weren't baptized by the one baptism, Ephesians 4, 4, that all must submit to in becoming disciples of Christ, Matthew 28, 19. People in the Bible who learned their baptism was no, were no, was no good were rebaptized the Bible way in Acts 19. If you want to be baptized the Bible way, we hope you'll contact us today. Looks like we have time for one of your questions. A dear lady from south of Springfield, Missouri asked, Did you notice in Jude 1 where it said the believers in Christ were sanctified, preserved, and called in Jesus Christ? Sounds permanent to me. Well, does that scripture teach that once a Christian is saved, then he can never fall away? Can he never be lost? Of course, we must take all relative scriptures on a given topic into consideration. The more scripture we find, the more light we have on any given topic. Notice, for example, that the Spirit says in James 5, verse 12, But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Writing to Jewish Christians, Paul says in Hebrews 4, 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Then in Hebrews 12, 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. We discover a similar message in 2 Peter 3, 17, Beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. The apostle warns against appointing a new convert to the eldership, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Keep in mind, Judas was handpicked by Jesus and had power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of of diseases, yet he fell. It was said of him, it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Stay with us and we'll tell you how you can get a copy of this lesson right after our song.
the issue that was addressed in our story today was Luke 10, verse 27, the great teaching there, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. The message that Jesus was getting across to the Good Samaritan was you can't pick and choose who your neighbor is going to be. Anyone who comes near you, no matter what their race or background is, is your neighbor. Thank you for watching. Let the Bible speak. We hope you have heard God speak to you through His Word. If you'd like to hear how you can obey the gospel and, ob and avoid hell's fury, or if you'd like to get a free copy of today's message, The Good Samaritan, or if you'd like to begin our free Bible study course, please write us at the address to follow or call 1-800-380-5827. You may also visit LetTheBibleSpeak.com to watch videos of the program. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.